I'm not sure they still do title songs for keynote speeches, but if I had to pick a title song, it would be let's talk about sex, baby, let's talk about GDP, let's talk about all the good things and the bad things that may be. I can't sing, so I will stop here. I won't sing anymore, at least during this presentation. Yes, that's it. But before I start with the presentation, allow me to say thank you. Thank you to Professor Arcadian and the entire team at UNU Flores, which really has done an excellent job in organizing this conference. And it has been a pleasure working with you in the run-up to the conference. I would like to thank you also for welcoming to this meeting the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, which I represent. The why is the United Nations Population Fund here? I mean, many of the people here are academics, they are more involved in the scientific community, they are more involved in maybe the natural sciences, in water issues, amongst other things. Well, we are here because we believe that this nexus that we are talking about has very important implications for us, the people. And that this nexus that we are talking about is shaped fundamentally by demographic changes, by changes in population dynamics. So popula population, populations, people, are in many ways at the center of this nexus. And populations is what we are doing at the United Nations Population Fund. The fund, by and large, focuses on sexual and reproductive health care, providing it to families, to women, to men, everywhere around the world. But it also has a focus on demographic change and how demographic change shapes some of the global and most important development priorities that we're looking at in the century and that we're discussing in the context of the post-2015 development agenda. In my presentation, I will speak a little bit about sex, about sexual and reproductive health care. I will speak a little bit about economic output. My presentation is broadly structured in three parts. The first, the challenges of sustainable development. The second, the confusion that, that still characterizes the debate to some extent on sustainable development. And the third, policy priorities for a sustainable nexus. The challenge. In 2011, the world population reached the 7 billion mark. How the world population will continue to grow, we don't know exactly, and it's not written in stone. That's very important to emphasize. A scenario that we are typically using at the international level and in the academic community is the so-called medium variant of the United Nations population projections. And that variant informs us that the world population will grow by the middle of the century to about 9.5 billion people. So between now and 2050, about as many people will be added to the planet as lived on the planet in total as recently as 1950. At the same time that we are adding more people to the planet, there are a lot of people living on this planet whose basic needs are not met today. One billion people about continue to live in extreme poverty. That is, one out of seven live with one dollar a day or less, or the equivalent of that, in a developing country. About 800 million suffer hunger. Many live in slums. The challenge of this century is to meet the needs of all those who have unmet needs and are already living, and to meet the needs of all those who will be added to the planet. And to do this, and this will require higher consumption, higher production, higher economic output. And to do this without imposing irreversible, catastrophic pressures on the natural environment. That, in essence, is the challenge of sustainable development. And meeting this challenge in many ways will require a different distribution of the goods and services or income, if you like, that we have. But let's be clear, it will also require 
much higher levels of economic output. Let me give you an example. Food security. Today, food security is by and large a question of access. We have enough food to feed the world. It's a question of whether people can go to a marketplace and buy the food they need. But in the future, it will become a question also of availability, of adequate agricultural output. To feed a world population of 9 billion, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations informs us, will demand an increase in agricultural output of about 60 to 70 percent. And actually, interestingly, this variation, depending how much we need, is to some extent influenced by decisions of the EU and the US on how to proceed with biofuel subsidies. Yeah? But there's a nexus here. But more people will not only need more food. They will need clothing, housing, shelter. They will need infrastructure, education, health. They will need a lot of other things. And everything, all goods and also all services that we are providing and that we are consuming have to be produced. And everything that we are producing will inevitably have an environmental impact. It will require us to either extract resources from the ground and or transform available resources into products and services. So now, in this situation, how can we move towards a sustainable development trajectory? That really is a key question. Let me come to the confusion. The three beautiful pillars of sustainable development. Everybody speaks about them. And, you know, when we started out on this journey, everybody said, hey, it's simple. To, in the future, we can't just focus on one aspect. We have to focus on all three aspects. We have to promote progress in all three areas alike. Then a smart person came and said, well, but that's not as simple because there might be linkages between them. Imagine you can meet the energy demands of a growing population, but if you do so through coal power plants, you might not progress on your environmental goals. So the, many people embarked on explaining all kinds of relationships between these three pillars. And many, some who have an education background, they start, may start with education and they say, well, education, that's clear, right? Has, is hugely important for economic growth. And education, it's clear, right? Is very important for environmental protection. And somebody who might have a background in hydrology will tell you, well, hydrology, we all agree, is essential for sustainable economic growth, for human well-being, for health, for many other things. And economists will tell you, well, without economics, there's nothing you can do. And what you are getting is a, an incredible web of proclaimed relationships in the literature and in the discussions. And to be clear, this web of proclaimed relationships, some of them might be true, they might be accurate. Yeah? But this web is often not based, these proclaimed relationships, on sound evidence hard evidence, data, and theory. And we have to identify what was mentioned in the very first keynote speech, I believe, the critical relationships in all of this web. If we don't succeed, this web will not help us move towards sustainable development. This web creates a fog. It creates a confusion. It might be intellectually stimulating. It might be academically interesting. It's politically entirely useless. Any policymaker, no policymaker, will know on the basis of all the proclaimed relationship what he or she should be doing to advance sustainable development. Or alternatively, they can justify whatever they want to do, arguing it's good for sustainable development. So how do we move towards a conceptual approach that really helps us identify policy priorities? I think all of us have to step back, to step back from who we are, what we studied, what we know, who we, who we represent, what our passions are and our interests. And we have to ask ourselves one simple question. What is development about? Why are we concerned with it? Not sustainable development, development. And I'm telling you, I'm an economist. I would never tell you it's economic growth we are concerned about. 
And 90% of my colleagues would not tell you it's economic growth. And you're hydro many of you are hydrologists, and I'm sure you would not tell me it's about the design of the most beautiful, efficient, multi-purpose water infrastructure for a city. We probably would agree it's about reducing poverty, increasing living standards, making sure that people, wherever they live on this planet, are able to enjoy basic goods and services. We probably would even agree on the, in the first 20 or 30 goods and services that are essential for human consumption and well-being. Food, water, many others. And that has to be our starting point. And then we are really getting a framework, or the outlines of a framework. We know what our ultimate objectives of development are. We know that economics is just a mean to these ends. We know that environmental destruction is just an undesirable side effect of the way we're doing business. We're not going out to destroy the environment because we don't like it. We destroy it because we produce goods and services for people in a way that's not sustainable. And once we have that outline, then we also see key interventions that are necessary. The first one, is that we need to get more social progress for any rate of economic growth. In the past years, many countries have had economic growth, but poverty has not fallen everywhere, and in many countries, you have high and rising inequalities. This requires an emphasis on labor markets, on productive employment, on social protection systems. But let's also be clear, there are limits to how much we can distribute resources. We might have a Robin Hood economy in our mind, but in reality, there are limits to that, not only economic limits to distribution. A social consensus, how you distribute resources, let's say in the north of Europe, would never be acceptable in the United States of America today. So there are social limits to how you distribute resources. There's a social discussion. The second key intervention area is to create greener economies. And this is really has to do with a lot of what we've been discussing here. Resource efficiency, waste management, recycling, the use of waste for all kinds of purposes, alternative energies. But let me also be clear, there is a third point, and many acknowledge it, but no, hardly anyone addresses it. We have to address population dynamics. I didn't know how to put this into this chart. But this is an ultimate factor that drives demand. In the last years, some countries have made progress in increasing their resource efficiency, significantly some. But our use of natural resources hasn't gone down. Our greenhouse gas emissions haven't gone down. And why? Because any improvement in resource efficiency is dwarfed, simply dwarfed, by higher consumption and living standards of the population and by more and more people on this planet. We have to shape population dynamics. And dem demography is not destiny. Whether, in fact, as I showed at the outset, the world population will follow the medium variant of the United Nations population projections, growing to 9.5 in the middle of the century, or about 11 billion by the end of it, or whether it will follow the high variant, for example, growing to about 10 billion by the middle of the century and 17 billion by the end of it, largely depends on what happens to fertility. And the differences between these scenarios is minuscule. It's on average half a child per woman, or maybe rather one child per every second woman. Yeah? It's a small difference that over time adds up to big differences in population numbers. So we can influence fertility levels, and we can do that not through top-down population controls that violate basic human rights and freedoms, and that we at the United Nations F Population Fund are not standing for. We can write in shape fertility decisions through bottom-up approaches that actually enlarge, if you like, human rights and freedoms. Most notably, every woman everywhere in this world should have access, unrestricted access, to sexual and reproductive health care and family planning. That's vital. Many of you might have daughters. 
I have a daughter. In some countries, it's the most normal thing that when they reach puberty, of course they have access to sexual reproductive health care services and family planning. In many countries of this world, it's not evident. Yeah? So ensuring this access is absolutely critical. Secondly, investing in education. Secondary education of girls in particular has a huge effect on fertility decisions. Yeah? Together, these measures, and actually in other countries, in some countries, not universally, but in, in some countries that have high population growth, violation of women's rights and discrimination are a huge issue. We have to abandon child marriage. In some countries, 70% of the women who were born in the last years got married before the age of 16. That has to stop. We have to empower women. We have to make sure they can participate in social, economic, political, and cultural life as equals in all countries in this world. And these measures will make a world of difference to people. It will reduce infant, child, and maternal mortality. It will help to curb the spread of HIV AIDS and other communicable diseases. But it will also reduce unwanted and teenage pregnancies, lower fertility, slow population growth. These are measures we have to take moving forward. But beyond efforts to shape population dynamics in these ways, it is also clear that some of these population dynamics will unfold no matter what happens to fertility. Populations will continue to grow even if fertility was to drop today to replacement levels. That's because of what we call population momentum. And populations will continue to move. So we have to use much more than is actually the practice population data and population projections for planning. If I was the mayor of a city, as I said yesterday, or the ruler of a country, and I was really serious about addressing the needs of my people, it's evident I need to know how many there are and will be, how old they are and how age structures will change, and where they are living. And will they be living in the rural areas or the urban areas? If we don't use demographic data and projections for planning, we will not understand or be able to meet the needs of people. So that's very critical. That's critical in anything we do, whether we want to build schools, a water infrastructure, hospitals, roads. Understanding your population is vital. A key question then is, do the current, does the current set of the Sustainable Development Goals reflect some of these policy priorities? Addressing demographic change. Demographic change is not destiny. Moving towards green economies. Green, uh, it's not a luxury. Yeah? Moving towards inclusive economies. Yeah? Do, are these issues addressed to some extent in the current set of sustainable development goals? And I don't want to go through all these goals, but I believe me that the key words and the key issues are covered. Yeah? Rather by maybe by, by coincidence rather than by design, but they are there. Personally, I think what comes short or what falls short is the use or the em emphasis on collecting and using demographic data for planning. In conclusion, as we are talking about the nexus, let's keep in mind what are the overall development priorities. Not what we think is important to do, but what is important for people. Let's keep in mind what the challenge of the century is. It's to meet the needs of people without destroying the environment. There are three policy priorities to this end. All three we have to pursue. And the Nexus approach will help us, hopefully, move towards solutions. The Sustainable Development Goals are goals. They are aloof to some extent. They are out there. We want to achieve them. The Sustainable Development Goals are not a development strategy. We now have to decide how do we move towards these goals? And the Nexus approach has to be fundamental in informing our decisions on what policy priorities we set for sustainable development. A challenge that we have, I believe, is the Nexus approach is by definition something interconnected and interdisciplinary. We have to bring more people together to talk about these Nexi, Nexi Nexuses, if you like. At the same time, we have to narrow the discussion to really focus on policy priorities. So it's a bit of a contradictory challenge that we are facing, but we have to resolve this challenge in the next years. 
And we, the United Nations Population Fund, we are very pleased to work with you on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Stay here for a while. <laughs> Thank you very much for pointing toward the policy relevant issues. I think that's very important because this all over is also a conference between science and politics and I think we have to arrive at decisions and therefore we need this policy uh, background. Uh, the discussion is open right now. So there's one, two, maybe in the back first, Janis, and then you. There's already one in the back and then Hi, I'm uh, Janusz Lysznik from UNESCO IHG in the Netherlands. Um, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I, I hope I'm not being too controversial in saying that many of the Millennium Development Goals, which are about to be superseded by the Sustainable Development Goals, um, many of those either failed in their objectives or moved very slowly towards meeting their objectives. And so basically my question is, well, what's going to be different or is there any difference between the MDGs and the new SDGs? and how to make it really work, and how to basically accelerate the progress towards those goals. Thank you. Do you want to take a round, or do you want me to respond to each one? Okay. I, as I just mentioned towards the end of my presentation, it is important that we don't see development goals as development strategies. The, S, the MDGs were sometimes, I believe, misunderstood to be a development strategy. If you just could do this and that, to make progress towards this and that, however you did it, it meant development. But really, the MDGs were largely social goals that neglected the important role of economics and neglected the important issue of the environment. So all of these have to be brought together with the SDGs. Hopefully, we have learned from the MDGs and we recognize, A, we need a balance between social, economic, and environmental objectives. They have to go in tandem. But also, hopefully, we recognize that just scrambling towards meeting these goals however we can is not a strategy. Yeah? We really have to have a development plan, we have to have an understanding of the countries, of their circumstances and of development priorities for countries. Hopefully we don't lose sight of the fact we need development strategies really. My name is Prakash Rao from India. So in the nexus of uh, technology, economics policy for a sustainable population growth. Where do you think is the greater challenge in one, I mean, how do you prioritize in terms of uh, challenges that, are, that we are facing globally in these three sectors so that it will help us to design in future a strategy for having an excess of among these three. Thank you. Well, what I, what I outlined here is, is let's say, a, an interrelationship at a very macro level. Yeah? So you, you, what you get is three broad areas for policy interventions. One is really to do with shaping, but also planning for demographic change. Yeah? And then itself entails many different nexi, if you want, to address that. It is a nexi between healthcare, education, human capital development, labor force participation. There are linkages there. Yeah? Another nexus is, if you like, creating inclusive economies, which has to do with productive employment, but also social contributions, pension systems, social protection mechanisms, another next side. In, in the environmental area, we have discussed many other next side during this conference, including the one between water, food, and waste. So within each of these broader areas are groupings. They, or of Nexi that have to be addressed. Huh? But I don't think that's a surprise. I mean, if we're thinking by only investing in health and family planning, we'll move towards a sustainable future, you're mistaken. Likewise, if you're thinking all you have to do is to design a beautiful water infrastructure and that will be sufficient, I'm afraid to disappoint you, you will be mistaken. There are many other things that matter. Yeah? And that's the recognition we have to have. But then within that, we have to decide what our focus is wherever we have our strengths and weaknesses and our capacities, and that's where we have to move forward. Okay, there was another. Danke, Okay. May I 
ask you to go to the microphone. Take yeah, there is a microphone. Okay. Uh, good morning, Michael. Thank you very much for a very inspirative presentation. You mentioned the role of women and also the, the need to empower the women. And it is articulated in uh, Sustainable Development Goals as well as it was in Millennium Development Goals. And we see that there was not so much progress. Uh, what would be your advice, recommendation, or how do you see? Because at the end, SDGs, whatever they will be decided at the UN level, they will be implemented in the field by the countries. So what would be a driving force to bring that, really, that targets or goals uh, to the eyes of the politicians or at the governmental level? Yeah, I would say that's a million dollar question and many have tried to do that and I think many have gotten it wrong. You know, I, I sometimes see studies that say, well, if you just empower women, it will contribute X percent to GDP growth. If you just do this in family planning, it will contribute X percent to GDP growth. And they come up with these studies because they think policymakers will listen to economic data. Huh? But I'm an economist. If I see studies like that, I'm wondering, wow, if this is so important, why does the central bank not consider how countries are doing on family planning issues or on empowering women? And regrettably, while it's important at a household level and makes a big difference at a household level for women participation in the labor market, at a macro level, it's completely irrelevant. It's blurred by other factors, stronger relationships that have a stronger impact. Yeah? So these kinds of studies are rather not helpful, I would say. I think we have to make fair arguments based on the evidence that we have. And if I can tell you it makes a difference for a household, whether we empower a woman for the income of a household, whether we provide family planning, whether they have eight children or whether they have four children or two children, I think it's a strong argument. But we have to make it on the basis of data and on the basis of evidence. Thank you very much. Thank you for the particip participation uh, in the discussion. Thank you for the talk again.